Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So are you tired of spending hours tweaking sliders in Lightroom only to feel utterly dissatisfied with your results? Do your photos lack the professional polish you crave despite your best editing efforts? If so, trust me, you are not alone. I have been through all of it. Whether you're a, a beginner seeking to refine your skills or maybe a seasoned professional aiming to fine tune your workflow, understanding and resolving these missteps will undoubtedly elevate your photographic skill set from misguided exposure adjustments to haphazard color grading. In this video, we'll dissect each mistake, offering practical and easy to follow solutions to set you on the course towards fast photographic improvement. Now, one of the most common mistakes I see photographers continually make inside of Lightroom is using the vignette tool. Now, I'm a huge fan of vignettes. I put them on 99% of all of my photographs, but I never ever use the vignette tool inside of Lightroom and I recommend you don't either. So what most photographers do, come down to the effects section and just drag the vignette slider over to the left, toggle this on and off so you can see the effect. And look, it, it looks like it did a good job. It darkened down the corners, left the center of the photograph brighter, which draws the viewer's eye into the scene, which is the purpose of a vignette. But the problem is this, is that it darkened all of the corners of the photograph the same exact way. And most of the time, let me just reset this, most of the time you don't want to treat all four corners of your photograph the same exact way. Every photograph is different. So having the ability to customize your vignette is of the utmost importance. And for some odd reason, the vignette tool inside of Lightroom gives you no ability whatsoever to do this, but there is a much better solution for you. So if you come up here to the mask section, we'll open this up, we'll hit the plus menu, we'll select radio gradient, I'm gonna make the image smaller on my screen and we're gonna make a huge radius across the entire photograph. And I'm gonna hit this invert button. This is the most important part because now you'll be able to tell that it actually flipped the radial gradient around. And now we're actually targeting the area outside of the gradient, which is very, very important. So when I uncheck it, you can see now we're targeting the inside part of the radius. Now we're checking the out, or now we're targeting the outside part of the radius. I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit, maybe bring the feather up just a touch more to something about right there. And now we can start to make our exposure adjustment to about maybe right here, I think looks okay. Let's uh, make this a little bit larger on the screen so we can easily see this. And let's toggle this on and off. So this is before and after, before and after. And you might be saying to yourself, Mark, it looks exactly the same as what the radio gradient, or what the vignette tool did. Yes, and it did, but what you'd have now is the ability to change this effect on certain corners. So what I don't like is how much it's darkening the upper left-hand corner of the sky up here. See that? I don't want that to happen. And what I can do is just hit the subtract button here, and I'm gonna come over here to brush. Let's make the brush a little bit smaller. Let's reduce the feather of this brush. And now, here, I'm gonna put the mask overlay on so you can see it. Now we can paint this effect away all through the sky up here all the way across here, the entire area. I'm gonna actually, let me make this flow 100 because I don't want that effect anywhere in the sky. I want it to be completely void of the vignette. And then if I want to make the vignette kind of slowly fade into the corners, I can just make a couple little swipes right through here and just make it the transition very, very soft and very, very subtle. So now when I toggle this effect on and off, you can see that it's really only affecting the inner part, or I should say the outer part of this beautiful beach right through here. And that's exactly what I wanted. I did not want this to affect any part of the sky. And I think that that looks much, much better. So the next time you want to put a vignette on a photograph, definitely, I should say, next time you wanna put a vignette on your photograph, definitely try out this kind of custom vignette tool. It is definitely something, it's one of those things, once you do it one time, you will probably never go back to using the vignette slider again. Now the next thing it has to do with white balance, and this is huge. This is a very, very common issue. And full disclosure, it's by far the number one aspect of photo editing that I struggle with the most is setting a white balance. Now, a common issue is how people use the white balance eyedropper. So what'll happen is a lot of times people come up to the basic section, grab this eyedropper picker, and the idea here is that you want to drop it on a neutral target to help Lightroom determine what a correct white balance is. And since I was actually on this ship, if I zoom in here, I think you can see me. Yep, that's me right there. But if I zoom out here, you know, this ship had white sails. So if, uh, if I click on this, you can see what it did. It made it extremely cool. And the reason it did that is because there is a warm colored cast across these uh, sails right through here. 
So if I pick the eyedropper again, let's maybe pick this area here. This is kind of a neutral area. Look how warm Lightroom made it. And that's because this area here has a very cool color cast to it. So a very common issue, and I see this all the time, and I used to do the same thing as well, is I would take the, the, the color picker and I would drop it on an area that's neutral, but nine times out of 10, that neutral area had some kind of color cast to it, whether it's a, a warm color cast or a cool color cast. And when you're trying to identify that neutral area, you really have to be careful that there is no color cast on there. And this is a great way to check for that. So what I can do is, let's come over here, we'll go back to this example, we'll drop it on the white sails. You can see how cool it made it. If you take the saturation slider and pull it all the way up to 100, you can see how the cool tones drastically dominate the entire photograph and there's very few warm tones here. Let me just undo this. Let's take our color picker again. Let's pick this area here that had the cool color cast. Drop that, we can see how warm it is. We'll take the saturation to 100. And now we can easily see how these warm tones are very much dominating the entire photograph and there's very few cool tones. So when you wanna try and pick the, uh, the a correct white balance or balance white balance or basically a, remove a color cast, you kind of want those the warm tones to not overpower the cool tones and you don't want the cool tones to overpower the warm tones. You want them to be kind of even a little bit. So what I like to do, let's just bring this back to as shot. Take this, we'll leave the saturation at 100. And I can see that the warm tones are definitely overpowering the cool tones. So I'm just gonna start to bring this more towards the cooler side to a point to where they seem a little bit more balanced. And I think that that is looking pretty good there. And now we'll just reduce the saturation back to zero. And it, what's funny is when you look at a photograph that's got saturation 100 and you take it to zero, it almost looks like it removes all the color. That just goes to show you how quickly your eyes can become used to something. But this right here seems to be a much more balanced white balance because like I said before, the warm tones and the cool tones are more in harmony. One is not overpowering the other. Now the next mistake, it has to do with sharpening. And this is a huge one. Everybody, especially beginners, love to sharpen photographs. We are almost obsessed with, with image clarity, image sharpness, enhancing detail. But a very, very common problem that I see is people not use it, utilizing the sharpening tool inside of Lightroom correctly. So what most people will do is, uh, I shouldn't say most people, but what a lot of people will do is what I used to do, is you come over here to the details section and then start to just bring the sharpening up to a level, you know, maybe somewhere right around here. And then you, you, you know, a common thing is you, you zoom in, you toggle it on and off to see the effect. And you usually are trying to, to get it to a point to where you can see that effect very easily. That's what I used to do. And then I would say, okay, now it's sharp enough because I can easily see that difference when I toggle it on and off. Here's the problem with that. Let me zoom all the way out here. If I come over here to the masking section and hold down the option on a Mac or control on a PC, you can see that the entire image becomes white. And as I click on this masking slider and start to bring it over, you can see something weird is happening. Now, if you remember this, that it's a, I think it's an old Photoshop saying that black conceals and white reveals. So when we come over here to the masking slider, if, when it's set at zero, everything is white. That means that this sharpening effect is being applied to the entire photograph. But as I start to bring this over, and I'm still holding down the option key on my keyboard, as I can bring it over, you can start to see that it's starting to change. And there's areas that are now in black and there's areas in white. And what I want to do is I basically, I don't want sharpening in the sky, or basically I don't want to sharpen things that are not sharp in real life. Like clouds are generally not sharp. Flowing water is generally not sharp. So I don't want to apply the sharpening to those areas. I want to apply the sharpening to the mountain. I wanna apply sharpening to the rocks in the foreground. I wanna apply sharpening everywhere, but the things that are soft, the sky and the water. And the masking tool gives you that ability. So holding down the option key, we'll drag it all the way over to a point to where the mountain is visible and all of the area around the water and the sky is not visible. So something to about maybe right here. And now that sharpening effect is only in the areas that I really want it to be sharpened. So usually utilizing selective sharpening is a very, very good route to go. Now this next issue, and this is a real quick one, has to do with exposure, incorrect exposure. Lightroom has an amazing tool to instantly tell you if something is underexposed or overexposed. And if you pull up a photograph and you're in the develop module and you just hit the shortcut key J, this is the clipping indicator. Red indicates areas of overexposed highlights and blue will indicate areas of underexposed shadows or basically areas that are too dark and red will indicate areas that are too bright. And that's just with utilizing the shortcut key J. It's an amazing feature. And then when you see this big red area, you know that that area is too bright. And then you can either bring down the highlights, you can maybe bring down the white point to a certain area. 
But utilizing that shortcut key J is a great way to just instantly tell if there's any areas of your photograph that you need to resolve. And I'd use it all the time before I export a photograph just to make sure that there's not an area, and this happens a lot of times if you've got like a bunch of rocks in the foreground that happens to be in shade. Sometimes there's little areas, little pockets of shadow in between those rocks that might be too dark. It might be areas of pure black. By hitting that shortcut key J, it'll automatically tell you if those areas are too dark, and then you can add a little bit of a pot, you know shadow recovery or maybe bring the black point up a little bit. And then same thing with the overexposure, uh, the, the clipping indicator as well. It's just a really good way to just double check everything just by hitting that shortcut key J. And now that I've resolved that, when I hit the shortcut key J, nothing is happening. Now this final one, and this is huge, and this happens all the time, and it's something that I never really used to pay a lot of attention to, but it's basically just dirty photos. And Lightroom gives you a couple of really good ability, or different tools, I should say, to fix the photos or to clean them up a little bit, but a lot of times people just don't even utilize them. So this is an image that I posted uh, a few weeks ago, and then here is the image after it was, I guess, clean. So this is the clean version, and this is the dirty version. And as you can see, let me just hit the develop module here. There is a lot of stuff right through here, a lot of stuff that I had to clean up. So what I like to do, and this is kind of a, a new tool, I suppose, this right here, this is the content aware fill tool. And we, if we just click this and just kind of bring it right over to this area here and let Lightroom just give a, a second to think, and it'll fill it in as best of its abilities. And you can see that it didn't do a great job. What's cool though, is if you hold on to the command key and you can just tell Lightroom that, you know, I want you Lightroom to use this area to fill in that area. And that usually will do a very good job. And of course that time it did not. Let me make the size of the, uh, the, of the brush that I'm using a little bit bigger, something about maybe like this and just kind of go around this whole area to make it a little bit larger. And let's see how that does. And that looks better. And let's hold down the command key and just say, Lightroom, I want you to use this area to fill in that area. And let's see how that did. And that looks much, much better. Here's another area here. Let Lightroom fix that. Give it a second here, see how that did. And let's use the command function again. Say, use this area to fill in that area. And I think that that is looking pretty good. It doesn't use that exact area, but it just kind of uses some kind of computing wizardry to, to make an area similar to that, fill in the area that you're wanting to fix. But then I would go through and clean up all of these areas here. Now, this is a very obvious example because these things are very, very obvious. You know, most people would probably clean these things up, but there are a lot of things where maybe there's a, an odd stick that's sticking in the side of your composition, or maybe just, just something weird. But I like to do this on the edges of my entire photograph before I export it, just to make sure that the edges are clean because you don't wanna draw the viewer's eye to the, to the, the corners of your photograph or the edges of your scene. And a great way to avoid that happening is to make sure there's just not odd distractions down there. So cleaning those things up is a very, very good uh, exercise to go through. So before I do wrap things up though, I just wanna say a big thank you to the longtime sponsor of the channel, which is Squarespace, who I use for all of my website and e-commerce needs. Squarespace provides a robust and beautiful online platform to develop your website. You can showcase your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and display your work using customizable galleries in order to make it your own. And with Squarespace's online store feature, you'll have access to all the tools you'll need to start selling your physical, digital, or service products online immediately. You can even use Squarespace's new asset library so you can upload, organize, and access all your content from a single place in order to easily find and use them across the entire Squarespace platform. Platform. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So I really do hope that some of that information is helpful. Hopefully you were able to get at least one, one piece of helpful information out of this week's video that you can apply to your photo editing workflow moving forward. If that is the case, and I am a happy man, and that is always my goal just to help people with at least one thing per video. So hopefully this video hit the mark on that. If you have any questions about any of these five common mistakes inside of Lightroom, please leave those in the comment section below. And I'll do my best to get back in touch with you as soon as possible. And uh, if you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really do appreciate you carving out a little bit of time to spend it with me here today. And I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.